Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, I'd like to show you some examples of tactics in the Sicilian defense. In our previous lesson, we saw what can happen in the French defense, and now we'll see perhaps the most popular of all openings, the Sicilian. The Sicilian happens when white plays e4 and black responds by playing c5. Normally, all games after these starting moves are considered Sicilian defense. The reason why I didn't say always, because sometimes it may transpose to another opening. But normally, it remains Sicilian and white most often continues by developing the knight to f3. Here white wants to play d4 as soon as possible to occupy the center. Black has many different ways to react to this opening. Black can try to develop his bishop by playing right now or in a couple of moves g6, which is typically considered a dragon variation, and there are various forms of that. Or black would play d6 or e6 to open up the diagonals of the bishops, or move one of the knights out to c6. We shall see uh, various games to see examples for the different choices. Right now, in our first example, black played d6, and here white most often plays the so-called open Sicilian by advancing the d2 pawn to d4, after which normally an exchange of pawns happens by black capturing the white pawn on d4. And then the white knight recaptures. And I'm not going to get to too much detail on what happens after that, but that's something that's being played extremely often. Getting back to this position, in the game we're examining, white played the pawn c2 to c3. You may wonder why would white do this? The reason is because white still is trying to play d4, but then when the black pawn captures the white pawn on d4, the idea is to then recapture with a pawn and not the knight or the queen. While this idea is well playable, it's not the most popular one. In this position, Black's best move is to move the knight out to f6, which in fact develops, but does not directly actually attack the pawn on e4, unlike what it seems. To demonstrate that, let me show you that even if the white bishop does not go to d3 to protect that pawn, but for example moves simply to e2, that would be an extremely tricky move because now knight takes pawn would be a blunder because it would position the knight onto an unprotected square, allowing a fork immediately by queen a4 check. And then on the following move after black blocks the check, the knight is gone. So that certainly would be an unpleasant trap. Of course, with that being said, after the knight move right now to f6, and then for example, bishop e2, by no means is black forced to capture that pawn, and of course they shouldn't. They can simply play e6 or g6, and then develop the dark squared bishop from f8. In this particular game, black responded by playing knight c6, developing the other knight. This is somewhat inferior, we shall see why. White played d4 as planned. The pawn is sufficiently protected by another pawn and the knight, and in fact, there is even an extra piece, the queen, protecting it. 
Now White has two plans. On one hand, one option would be if White could make another move to advance the pawn to d5 and then the black knight wouldn't have a very comfortable square to go to. For example, right, if black plays knight f6 and then d5, if not, the black knight would try to remain in the middle of the board, then white could exchange the knights, forcing the black d pawn onto the e file. And as we can see now, black has two pawns doubled up on the e file, which would be certainly inferior than having them on independent separate files. Going back to this position, after knight f6, if now white plays d5, the knight cannot well go to a5 because the knight there would be trapped immediately by attacking the knight with b4. And the c4 square, of course, is guarded by what? The white bishop. Okay, let's go back again and see the position after d4. Black should have traded pawns on d4 and then continued developing, but instead black moved his bishop out to g4. This move pins the white knight on f3 and in fact kind of threatens to capture it. For example, if white would respond by attacking the bishop with h3, then the black bishop could capture on f3 and now white would have to choose from some unpleasant choices, either by recapturing with a pawn, which would double up pawns on the f file, or if the queen would capture, now all of a sudden there is only one defender left on white's d4 pawn, and that's not sufficient because after pawn takes pawn, black wins a pawn. If pawn now takes on d4, the black knight from c6 would win the pawn. But white can do better here. And white played d5, which is an excellent move, attacking black's knight. Here black should have realized the trouble he may face and be more careful than he was. As we already learned from a previous variation, if right now the black knight would move to a5, the same problem would come that white could attack that knight with b4 and indeed trap it. Now the black knight can only move to another square that would be not safe where it would be captured. The best choice black has is to retreat the knight to b8 which of course is never something to look forward to. In the game, Black played the most natural move, but in this case, it was a serious mistake. Black moved the knight to e5 in the hopes that the white knight is pinned and therefore cannot capture the black knight. And in other cases, the black knight would be ready to trade on f3. The problem is that this is an exceptional situation when even though it seems that the white knight is pinned, in reality, white can still move that knight and still capture black's knight on e5. In this situation, black cannot recapture on e5 the knight without losing his bishop on g4. But how about if the black bishop will capture the white queen instead? How can this be a good deal for white? Well, normally it's not and it cannot be. However, in this case, because the black king hasn't got to its safety zone yet and it's in the middle, white is able to attack that king immediately by playing bishop to b5 check. As we can see, the black king is surrounded by his own pieces 
end is limited by the edge of the board. As we know, there is no ninth rank. Black has no other choice but to block the check with the queen. And that means that the white bishop on the next move can capture that with yet another check. And at this point, white is a piece up. And after king moves to d8, of course, white could simply capture the bishop on d1, maintaining an extra piece even after black captures the knight on e5. But it's even better to first move knight to f7, capture the pawn with a check. And when the king captures the bishop, then king captures bishop. At this stage, white is up already, an extra knight and pawn. And in addition, the black rook in the corner is trapped as well. I'm showing these examples so you get ideas for the opening early stage of the game, because sometimes you may have extra opportunities to gain an advantage early on. Or of course, just as importantly, Make sure you don't fall into one of the opening traps against people who listen to my lectures or read some other opening trap books. Most of the time in the openings, there aren't that much tactics, but yet there are some cases that it's helpful to be familiar with. Let's move on to our second example in this lesson. Again, we're seeing a game that starts out as a Sicilian. e4, c5, knight f3. So far, this game is identical to our previous one. And black responded differently by developing his knight to f6, immediately attacking the pawn on e4. In this position, white's most common move is to advance that pawn forward to e5 and to attack the black knight on f6. That is perhaps the very best choice. But in this game, white played the second best and moved his knight to c3, which still protects the pawn on e4 and continues developing at the same time. Black's answer was d5, immediately starting challenging white in the center. The pawn on d5 is safe, being protected twice by the black queen and knight. White responded by advancing the pawn to e5. This move, of course, attacked the black's knight. Now black has to be careful where to go. If the black knight would go to d7, which is a natural looking move, the pawn on d5 may be captured. If the knight would move to g4, white could chase the knight further back and to not a great square to h6. Of course, the knight could go back to where it came from, to g8, but that's never fun. Of course, if your choice is to lose a knight or some material, you choose the ugly compared to the immediately losing one. In the game itself, black moved his knight to e4, which is a good thing if it's not bad, but in this case, it's certainly a bit dangerous move. And now white moved the knight to e2. This looks like a strange move, moving backwards and locking up the development of the bishop on f1. However, it's a tricky move at the same time. And black was careless, not thinking about what white is planning. It's very important that you always think, what does my opponent want to do? And after black's next move, which was bishop to g4 developing, you'll see what is what black forgot about. While the knight on e4 looks nice and centralized, the problem is that because of white's pawn on e5, the knight cannot easily retreat. And that means that when the white pawn goes to d3, attacking the knight, the knight is trapped. Because anywhere it would move, 
it could be captured by white. Let's go on to the next example that will start out the same way that this game just did. e4, c5, knight f3, knight f6, and knight c3. Kasparov played it also. This game has been played by a very young Kasparov, only about 14 years old, in a game played by Telex. His opponent responded by playing e6, a typical developing move, and now the game transposed to the so-called open Sicilian by white playing d4 and black trading and the white knight coming to d4. Here, black has many playable choices, probably the most common one playing the pawn to e to d6, preventing white's pawn advance to e5. Another move that try, aims to do exactly just that is to develop the knight to c6, also controlling the e5 square. Yet in this game, black chose neither of those two common options, but moved his bishop to b4, immediately creating a pin over the white knight on c3, and because of that, attacking the white pawn on e4. Right here, typically advances the pawn, which is the best option, attacking black's knight immediately, and black played knight to d5. Again, using the pin on white's knight on c3. White played bishop to d2, protecting the knight that was under dual attack. Black traded knights with the idea to force white onto a situation with double pawns on the c5. And now black has to face some difficulties. If right now the black bishop retreats to e7, then white could start an immediate attack by playing queen g4, going after black's pawn on g7. And the trick here is that black will have to make some unpleasant move, such as advancing the pawn to g6, which would weaken the dark squares on the king's side, or retreating the bishop to f8, which again doesn't look very attractive, because if black would castle right away, the white bishop would go to h6, and now threaten checkmate on g7, and the best way to avoid the checkmate is to advance the pawn, but then white would win an exchange after capturing the rook. That is why, in this position, black rather retreated the bishop immediately back to f8. Of course, that doesn't look very nice either. White continued developing, as he should do in the early stages of the game. Black played d6, trying to get rid of white's pawn on e5, which, as we've seen, can be really unpleasant, taking away important squares from black. And the response was queen e2. And this was the critical moment of the game where black went wrong. We can see that already at this moment, white is very nicely developed with all his pieces, when black has all the pieces back on the eighth rank. This doesn't look good. Nevertheless, black can get in serious trouble by making a careless move, which black played knight d7. Looks like a normal developing move, but in this case, because black is already so much behind development, this already loses material. And here is the elegant combination that Garry Kasparov pulled off. Knight e6, capturing the pawn, but sacrificing a knight. First of all, what happens if black captures that knight? Well, 
the check arrives with queen h5. If now the black king moves out to e7, white could respond with the bishop check on g5 and at least win back the sacrifice material with an advantageous position. Even worse would be trying to hang on to the material advantage by playing g6 because then white would capture that and sacrifice the bishop followed by king e7 and bishop g5 where black would end up losing even a whole lot more material. After white gave the knight up with knight e6, black in the game chose not to capture it in hoping that then black would only stay a pawn behind. But this was a worse choice because now white was able to pull off a new trick, namely knight c7 chuck. As you can tell, this knight is attacking the black king and the black rook at the same time. But the question is, can black just capture this knight simply? Well, they can, but then the loss will be even bigger because all of a sudden, after pawn takes pawn, white opens up the e-file giving a discovered check and black will lose the queen. Let's see the next game. White played e4, c5, knight f3, just like all the other games we've seen so far in this lesson. e6, d4, open Sicilian. And here black played a6, which is called the Paulson variation. And here white would play normally, either developing the knight to c3, or the bishop to d3. In either way, the game leads to a very complex game. But what happens if white instead develops the other bishop to f4, trying to focus in on some weakened square on d6? While strategically it's a good idea and it develops a piece, tactically it has a shortcoming. And in reality, Black now can win material. Try to think and see if you can figure out what that tricky move is that wins a piece. And that move is e5. Amazingly now, black forks the white bishop and knight. But you may wonder, can the white bishop just capture that? Yes, they can, but perhaps this reminds you of a trick I mentioned earlier at, at one of the previous games. Now the black queen appears on a5, checking the white king and at the same time attacking the white bishop on e5. After white blocks the check, the bishop will be lost. And let's see our last example for this lesson. Again, we'll see the same opening moves, the Sicilian, knight f3, e6. And in this game, white again chose to play knight c3 first and not immediately d4. Black played a6 and d4 arrived. Bones exchange. As usual, the white knight captures back in a situation like this, not the queen. We do not want to capture back with the queen because that would allow an immediate attack on the queen with knight c6. So therefore, knight takes d4 and knight c6. This is again a position that has been reached many, many times in the Paulson variation. In this case, the bishop move to f4 works well because if black would respond by playing e5 right now, then white could trade knights, attacking the black queen for a moment, and then on the following move, safely capture the pawn on e5. After bishop to f4, black made a mistake though. Black played knight ge7. 
looks like a normal developing move, but in this case, the problem is that if you can imagine a knight coming on to d6, that would be a fancy smothered mate. And because of that idea, white can go knight d to b5, even though that square seems to be guarded by black's pawn and black can capture that knight, a second knight arrives on that very square. Black is in trouble. In the actual game, black played d5, when white first kind of traps the queen and then the king. By attacking the queen now, the bishop is protected by the knight. Queen has only one safe square to go to on d7. And then knight d6 traps the king. Chuck, the only legal move black has is to give up the queen for the knight, but that results in white's major gain in material. Let's go back just a couple of moves. After bishop f4 and knight e7, what did white play? Do you still remember the move? It was a fancy move sacrificing the knight. Knight b5 takes, takes. We saw what happened in the actual game where black played d5. Let's see for a moment how the game would end if black would move the knight, making escape for a black king. White would play knight c7 check. If queen takes knight, of course, the bishop captures. And after king e7, in addition to capturing the rook, white can do much better, namely checkmate in two by queen check, followed by knight checkmate. Very beautiful. And finally, last but not least, if we go back just a couple moves in this critical position, instead of d5 or knight g6, if black now plays knight d5, preventing knight c7, remember black is a knight up, so he can afford giving a knight back, then simply we take it, renewing the threat of knight c7 check, and after e5, the winning move is pawn to d6, again threatening to trap the black king with knight c7, and white's advantage is huge. Well, I hope you gained some new ideas for the opening for the Sicilian defense. Keep coming back to learn more chess goodies at the Polgar Chess University. Thanks for listening. So long until next Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.